Hi everybody, Nigel here, back again. Another video for you, uh, this time on the um, on the Land Rover. And um, yeah, if you remember the last video, we looked at doing the using the Coralus primers. Uh, it's now, what is it today? Sunday the 22nd, I guess, of December. And um, I've done the first coat of the RF16, the gloss black, which I'll show you on a couple of parts in a minute. It's very nice. When I did this, I used the air, the compressor, rather than the airless spraying. Um, I found I get much better atomization with it and a much better finish. In fact, on some of the parts, I feel I'm going to need to flap them back where the, the airless spraying of the Coralus primer has left quite an orange peel finish, almost grainy kind of finish. So that needs to be flatted back and then recoated with the RF-16. But I'm going to leave that like at least a week to fully harden off. I've actually got those parts in the house on the radiator so the paint is almost kind of baking on. Um, get it you know nice and hard before I flat it back and then give it another couple of coats of the RF-16. RF-16 being the gloss black. The video today is all about uh, getting the engine out. Um, why am I taking the engine out you ask? Three reasons. One, I want to gain access to all of the chassis to be able to paint it, clean it up properly. There are small areas of rust everywhere. To be honest, most of it is on the outer sides of the chassis and the top. Um, the underside seems to be really, really good for some reason. I did wax oil it all when I bought it brand new, so I should imagine the wax oil has all crept around the lower areas, which, is, which has helped. But I also want to show you um, on the chassis, if I remember in this video, I'm going to show you the extensive preparation that Land Rover go to on these chassis before they paint them. Not. Um, it's a joke, and I'll show you that in this video. Um, in fact, I'll probably do that next, after I show you these gloss black parts. So then we're going to look at taking the engine out. Um, it's quite a lengthy old process, and it becomes very clear when you work on these Pumas. They did not think of the guy that's going to work on it in the future at all. No consideration whatsoever. Uh, I think I mentioned before, there's stuff like Jubilee clips put in place, and then when the engine's fitted, you can't actually get to the screw because the the wings in the way or something like that. It's absolutely ridiculous. And then they've gone and done this new bulkhead without the, the vents across the top. Well, the, the gearbox cover, the actual tunnel in the bulkhead is spot welded in now rather than a removable panel. So you can't really get to the top of the gearbox. And when you take the engine out, there's a, there's a couple of looms that go over the top and around the gearbox. One for the crank position sensor and one is for the reverse light switch, I think. And um, oh, they're in these there's cable tile little clips holding them into the gearbox and you just can't get to them you know and um some of the the bolts on the bags in trying to get to those is just a joke if they'd have just made that tunnel removable with screws like every other land rover has always been it would have made life a lot easier for the poor guy that's come along and working on it afterwards but hey i expect somebody sat behind a computer saved three pound fifty per vehicle and got a great big promotion for it well done, whoever you are, thank you very, very much. You've made our lives hell. Thanks for that. Uh, but I've been an engineer all my work in life, and I've seen this everywhere I've worked. I'm not going to mention any names, but cost-cutting, 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 sod everything else, it's just cost-cutting. And um, it was one of the pleasures of working at Rolls-Royce Aerospace. The only consideration that was ever made when a modification was requested was weight. You know, obviously, if it was going to cost five times the price to make the same thing, then obviously there'd be questions asked. But nobody ever said, you know, um, if we're going to add an hour to this process to get a, you know, a 15% improvement in first time pass rate, then that was that. As long as it didn't add any weight, that's all they cared about. And if you could save weight, wow, you were a hero. But um, no. Um, yeah, you can see all over this thing, all over it. When I've had, I used to have an 84 Land Rover, and when you can see when you look at this thing in comparison, it is not designed for the guy to work on at home at all. Um, they, they, I'm not on about technology, electronics and stuff. I'm on about simple, simple design of manufacture, and it's just, it's just designed to be thrown together in the factory, clipped together, and then that's it, you know. Um, oh, the other thing I've done is I've removed, removed the brake calipers to give them a look and um, found that all eight pistons in the brake calipers are rusty. Here they are here. Um, there we go, just to show you. There's one of them there. You, know, you can see how badly rusted that is. 16,000 miles, nine years old, knackered. So I've bought the um, 
you can see that one there that one started to rust around where the seal was as well so these are um they're going in the scrap bin or they'll go in the scrap metal bin and they'll be um i've, I've got the brit part uh, stainless steel uh, brake piston seal kit on the way so i'm going to give the calipers a nice cut of red paint because i'm a tart and um and yeah, so they, they've all been cleaned and scrubbed up, so we can start getting those painted later on. But let me get down onto the bench here and show you these gloss black parts, um, so you can show you how good this RF-16 paint is. And then we'll go outside and start looking at the Land Rover. Right, so here we are. This is, um, this is the tie bar that goes across the bottom of the steering box. It bolts to the bottom of the steering box and then um, goes into the, into the vertical member that goes down and does the uh, panard rod for the front. So um, you can see on there, Really, really nice, um, very nice gloss finish. This actually had two coats of the Coralis primer sprayed on. Um, in fact, the yeah, the the, the Coralis primer on these couple of not these couple of parts, but a couple of the parts, the steering box being one of them, I sprayed on with air rather than the airless. So but you can see the cast in there, and um, yeah, really, really nice. I did sandblast these, but there was only a very, very slight amount of rust on them. So um, what I actually did was sandblasted them. And then went over them with a wire brush in a drill just to clean them up and the paint that was on there was actually very very tough uh, in the places where it hadn't rusted i can only assume the parts get chucked in a bin and assembly and um, areas get chipped off and then they rust but this was probably one of the best parts of the vehicle for 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 the paint lasting so that's going to get a second coat but you can see that's nice and shiny and then here's one of the um pressed steel brackets from underneath the uh, from underneath the bonnet you may see on there some evidence of the corrosion that was around those holes you can see there the paint's a little thin you can see the red showing through but again we've got this you see this orange peely finish which I'm not going to fuss too much about if it's like this but if it's actually quite grainy then I'm going to rub it down and, and do it again so I can get a nice finish on it um, it's worth doing once it's worth doing right so um, yeah there we go so I'm happy with that you can see there's some rust there by the look of it. So, uh, yeah, and we can see the Land Rover lo logo coming through. Let's go out and have a look at outside. Right, here we can see the um, the tunnel, as you can see. It's spot welded all around the front there, where it meets the bulkhead, and it comes right back here. So all you're left with is like a sort of five inch wide slot to work in. I've got a bag shoved in there to stop cats and the like getting up in here. But um, yeah, so you can see that that is, uh, that is really handy. Thanks very much for that Land Rover. Really good idea. I'm tempted to draw those spot welds out and replace them with screws because it would just make life so much easier. And also you'd be able to then, I expect, lower it down and get the heater in because of that stupid bracket that gets in the way of the heater. Watch my first video, you'll see what I mean. So um, here we go guys, let's have a look at the engine. Right, so where do we start? As you can see, I've got the starter motor out. I'm not sure if that's really necessary, but I took it out anyway. I think it may have dragged on the bellows and as it came through and could have broken the casting. So there's that. Um, I've also removed a lot of the hoses from this side of the engine, as you can see, just to try and give myself some access into those bellows and bolts. And there's some rubber pipes that go all the way around the back onto the EGR, which you can see aren't there on that one. Um, they kind of go into this gap here around there so um so that sort of makes life a lot easier uh, and they do come off quite easily with all the clips and everything a couple of the pipes are jubilated you can see i've got this pipe here which is up over there um and then this this uh, pipe here is, is just pushed into there just, just to keep them out of the way when the engine is removed the other thing you'll need guys is a um some means of lifting the back of the engine here you can see i've made this bracket here which bolts on the camera in you can see yeah, that guy's dog started barking so yeah, you can see there's this bracket it's just a piece of inch um l-shaped steel and basically uh, there's two m8 bolts that go in the back here they bulk into the bolt into the back of the head if you look you can buy a transit um engine lift thing for about 20 quid but 20 quid is 36 cans of fosters at asda so i made the bracket myself and those holes guys if you want to make your own bracket those holes are 48.5 millimeters apart and they're M8 bolts. And then here I've got a, um, a 716th UNF bolt in there, um, just basically to put the lifting eye on so that it can swivel without actually trying to twist that around. So that's the lifting eye at the back. The lifting eye at the front is actually on the engine. You can see I've got the rod here holding the bonnet up. 
So there we go, you can see the engine's quite, um, this bracket here is quite rusty, all this is going to get a refresh while it's out. Um, I did see earlier there were three reasons I'm taking it out. Uh, one is obviously to get to the chassis, two um, is I want to change the oil pump. Uh, apparently the oil pumps are quite dodgy on these. And three, I want to check the clutch because the clutch can be dodgy as well. So, And I've also got down here, if we look, I've got some seepage around the around the front crank seal but look if I can't make out if it's the front cover the sump or the crank seal but it's very very weird it looks like the pulley's been blowing the oil around a bit so um we'll have a look at that um engine mounts are all undone there's two 15 mil bolts at the bottom and then one 18 mil nut at the top there you can see the same on this side which you can't really see very well from here and then basically the diesel pipes need to be disconnected and they just these connectors so you just squeeze squeeze that yellow bit and it pops out and then pull that plug out of there and then we'll put the pipes over out of the way and then we've got 10 out 10, 10 bellows and bolts around the back there's three across the top which you have to reach down in the gap in there in here to get to so i've got my bloody finger in the lens here we go so down down in here there's there's three bolts across the back um little bit difficult to find but once you find them they come undone they're all done 13 mil heads on those and then there's another load of bolts going around the bottom so what we'll do is we'll get the weight on the engine lift I'll lift it get these mounts out of the way and then I can drop it down a bit and um, the gearbox will then sit on the gearbox cost member with a piece of wood in between so let me get on and get that done just one more thing guys the manual doesn't mention at all down here looking down at the back of the engine now there's the turbo there so you can see here I'm looking down in the back of the engine there's the bell housing there and then you've got the engine block is the rusty bit you can see there's the crank position sensor um, in the manual they tell you to take the cable off obviously what they don't tell you is over that is this this tin or this aluminium heat shield to protect it from the heat of the exhaust manifold um, and there's the number for it there if you need to get one and basically there is no mention of it at all um it takes a bit of working out but i worked out that these you can see we've got these two spring clips here they go in and they spring into the actual aluminium casting on either side okay so you've got that little steel bracket there which makes it a bit of a nightmare to um to get it off but you kind of squeeze it together and pull it around and it, it will come off don't try and pull it vertically up it doesn't come off just Get your hands in there, squeeze those tabs in and it comes out easily. So there's another little tip for you that's not anywhere written down. Here are some bolts from the, these are from the bell housing, these are the starter motor bolts. There's the bell housing bolts. And you can see they're all very clean and rust free and everything. But I'm wondering what the plating is, can somebody tell me? Um, there's a guy, I think it's Jeff Parker his name. He's doing a restoration series and he talks about zinc plating. now. That looks like to me like a zinc plating that hasn't been passivated. So if anyone can tell me what it is, I'd love to know. Thanks very much. Okay, so there's the bolts, 10 of them. Two of the longer steel ones, they go down the uh, the driver's side, the, uh, the right hand side of the engine, and they go from the block back into the gearbox. And all these others are identical and they all go from the gearbox into the block. So I thread it into the block, thread it into the gearbox. Um, so you don't need to keep, worry about keeping them separate because they're all exactly the same and these two are obvious because they won't even fit in there because they're not long enough and here's the tools you'll need um i ended up getting up and down up and down up and down and out from underneath it if you're on a ramp it's easy but when you're on the floor it's a pain in the ass so i've got a half inch long extension for breaking them uh, on the ones you could get to and obviously a 13 mil socket then there's a half inch uh, sorry a 13 mil ratchet spanner which makes life a lot easier for getting the ones out again that you can get to a long 13 mil spanner uh, a few of them were very very tight and um, you can't get in over the socket so I use them extended 13 mil socket tiny little um, I can't really call these now wobble or something isn't it but it's a tiny little ratchet which is really handy and then you've got the the normal 3 8 ratchet normal 3 8 socket obviously long socket and then the long extension so if you take all those tools under with you you won't have to come out again and the other thing that's worth noting all the ones that are easy to get to like the two on the bottom of the bellows in it's like crack and then they come out with your fingers the ones up the sides where you have no access need to be screwed all the way out yeah thanks for that so uh, i'm going to put a block of wood a block of wood here i'm going to put that now on the cross member so that the gearbox sits on that and then when i pull the engine forward the gearbox will be staying solid on its mounts on the transfer box and then sitting on that block of wood so let's see how we get on and here we go guys it is 
lift it up. I know I've got a rag on the top of the engine to protect the plastic cover because, as I said earlier, I'm a big tart. And you can see that everything's lovely and clean in the bell housing, so only to expect it after 16,000 miles, but she is nine years old, so we can see on that bracket there that supports the ECU, we've got more rust, which is great. I'm just glad that it seems nothing painted green has rusted, but everything painted black has. So there we go. But we can see there's a massive dual mass flywheel there, we've got a clutch on the back, which is one of the reasons for taking the engine out to check that. I've removed the engine mounts. Um, and your mounts go down here obviously in these two holes and then up through the, the mounting here which is behind behind the water pump. Um, the reason being this obviously this elbow here is plastic and obviously one bang and it'll be gone that'll be that and then obviously underneath because this is the 2.4 I've got the plastic um, oil filter cover which is quite expensive to replace so I didn't want to hit them. Um, I've got a one inch block if I can get the camera down there get them on this side, I don't know if we can see it from down here, no, um, get the camera underneath, you might be able to see it, I don't know, here we go, you can see down there, if you look, where's my finger, here, just there, I've got the gearbox sat on a one inch block of aluminium, so um, that's got the gearbox supported anyway, and, uh, and that's that. Um, so yeah, leave the gearbox cross member in guys. Catalyst is a bit of a pain in the ass, uh, gets in the way. Again, this engine mount is taken out on this side. Just makes it easier, you can swing the engine around and, and stuff. So um, what I've got to do now is take this slam panel out and then we can finally get them lifted out. There you go guys, it's out on the garage floor. And the dog's just checking the clutch out for me. So uh, yeah, that's the bit that's got to come off and we'll have a look inside there and see if it's all rattly. Also notice there's a bit of rust on the sump around the front, so uh, we'll have to get a new sump anyway, we'll see how bad it is. That's um, where's my woolly hat there, protecting the wings from getting scratched. So uh, yeah, there we can see it's out. Okay, so we'll come to Land Rover and have a look. We can see here we've got the, um, there's the bellows in, which is, uh, as we say, really, really clean, which I guess we'd expect. Looks like a bit, a bit of a leak on the back of the engine, you can see on the top of the bellows in, here we've got some, uh, some oil there, so have a look at that. Um, cat looks like it's in good condition, as you can see, rust on the chassis. I must show you in this video as well the uh, extent of the uh, preparation that they do. Um, and then we can see everything's out, fuel lines over there, all bagged up to protect them. And uh, you can see there's the, there's the return fuel line there. And uh, yeah, so basically get some more brackets off and get some painting done. I, I intend to do all the brake and um, clutch housing boxes as well. I need to drain the clutch fluid out that drain overnight. And then, uh, and for those of you that want to do an engine removal with the bonnet still on, you can do it. We've got a broom handle here, down in the inner wing. You can see it's sat on top of the spring tower. And then, up there, the broom handle goes into that hole. And uh, job done. We've got blue sky as well, look at that. Just a couple of clouds. Who believe it's December, eh? So, um, there we go. So, I'm uh, really happy with this and the way it's going. Let's go and show you this chassis rust. Okay, so I want to show you some of this chassis rust and the preparation. The reason it rusts is because of the complete and utter lack of preparation done at the factory. Um, these aren't made by Land Rover, are they? are made by a supplier, I think GKN is it? Um, and then obviously they're welded together and then just dipped. Um, there is no post weld preparation whatsoever by the look of it. If you look here, you can see, I can just, this is just a simple old, you know, paint scraper I use in the garage. You can see I can just knock the paint off of that weld as if it was like a slag coming off an art weld. You can see it's not bonded to the weld at all. And then all around here, you can see all this weld spatter. And I'll take this screwdriver. Okay, I've got an old knackered screwdriver. Right, so I've got a hammer. It's just gives a simple tap. And it's gone. Okay, so that's how you get rid of all the well spatter which will again give you better paint you can see there you maybe can't see there but I can see it there's a piece of well spatter that's broken off which is what started the rust so it's worth just getting rid of this stuff like so and it gives you a smooth finished as well 
which again is, you know, not necessarily necessary on a chassis, but... Okay, so that's my bit of advice for the chassis. Back to the engine. Um, I've got a bit of a problem. I can't find my engine stand. What am I going to do? Um, give me five minutes. Well, I found it and it was in the house. Yes, uh, I'm a bachelor, so I'm allowed to do things like that. And because I'm a bachelor and there's nobody here running around after being cleaning up and stuff, yes, there's all the bolts as well, all still together, so everything's cool. Um, so that's all good. Now, I need to remove the clutch cover and plate, obviously, and the flywheel if I'm going to put it on an engine stand. Now, if I'm going to check this oil pump out or change it, then I need to get it on an engine stand. I'm not going to mess around with it on the floor upside down and stuff. There's too much plastic and aluminium castings and stuff. You know, you can just imagine rolling it over here. You've got plastic water pump housing here. You've got plastic housing there. You know, there's all this plastic around here. There's that thin pipe on the intake plastic manifold you know it, there's so much that can easily get damaged guys so it's worth getting on engine stand and one thing i will say on the subject of engine stands when you see this built up we'll, we'll talk about engine stands then very important for for safety of you and your engine as well and any of these little things that might be running around with you while you're playing um so what i did i've made a tool for locking up the flow i made this many many years ago believe it or not this is um it's obviously it's just a bolt and a spacer there for putting it on the engine. One of the beauties of this engine, the, all the bolts around the bellows and it's just plain M10 threads, so that's, that's good. Um, but this is basically a piece of tube, you can see, welded to two pieces of ring gear. And I believe these were R32 GTR <laughs> ring gears. So, um, yeah, Nissan Skyline off of a knackered flywheel. So, um, basically there we go so i'm just going to put this on the back of the engine now and then i'll show you how it works okay so just to show you how this thing works you can see i've got a, a bolt through here just an m 10 bolt it's not tightened up it's loose so it can uh, so this can can pivot about and what i do is if i tighten this clutch no because actually the clutch nuts probably come undone without the um without this anyway but basically if you just turn the flywheel you can see that locks in place okay so that's now locked the teeth and now if i change the I can undo the clutch bolts without having any fear of the flywheel turning. That one was tight. So there we go. And it's not sat on this wooden box here. It's actually hanging on the engine crane still. It's just that it's uh, just balancing it there. So I can get the flywheel off. Okay, so first things first. Um, I stupidly told you to fit this tool the wrong way around. You can see the way I fitted it now. Um, basically, if it's hanging down, as you turn the flywheel, when you try to do these bolts, which are bloody tight, um, it just skips away. So it needs to be down, uh, down on the flywheel, and then as you turn the flywheel, it sort of bites in, it can't go anywhere. But you can see that it's, um, it's I can't hold the torch and the, and the phone at the same time. But you can see it's bitten in there, but um, still, still not tight. So. A really really good little tool if you've got an old flywheel knock the ring off it and make one of these up it's a really handy little thing to have so these flywheel bolts are all undone now um they are bloody tight so i used a, a breaker bar to uh, to get them and apparently they have to be replaced i don't know if anyone can tell me but i'm not sure if they have to be replaced purely because they've got um thread lock on them or if they are actually stretch bolts but i don't think they cost the earth anyway the other thing, I looked on the uh, John Craddock site and it said they were £3.70 or something. I don't know if that's each or for all of them. But I found another website that's the Ford Transit ones for £8.75 a set. So anyway, let's see. Um, the other thing is I've got the clutch off. As you've just seen, obviously. And there it is. Uh, you can see it's got hardly any wear on it at all. Get the plate off. You can see it's uh, the rivets are well down in there well recessed so there's loads of life in it this has done 16,000 miles but unfortunately yeah it's toast the springs all rattle around so apparently that means it's knuckered um unless you know different if i shake it you can just hear it and these springs are all they're all loose i can just rattle them around you see that one they're just turning so and that one so i'm not sure if that means it's knackered or what but um yeah, such a shame. Um, I kind of wonder if I could just get away with a with an actual um, friction plate because you can see the driven plate. You still see the turning marks in it. So I mean, here you can see a bit closer. You can still see the turning marks in that plate. It's not worn at all. 
So, um, let's see. So I'm going to go on and get this flywheel off and then I'll be back. Okay, the flywheel's off. As we can see, just like the driven plate, the flywheel is in immaculate condition, so that's lucky. Um, another thing worth noting, guys, if you're going to get one of these TDCIs, you're planning on working on yours, you've got these, um, what I call female Torx bolts. And um, you basically need to get yourself a set of sockets like this. These are little 3 8 drive ones, which do be absolutely fine. I've got half inch 3 8 conversion. It's never broken, never let me down. So, and uh, the one you need for that is E4. Sorry, E14. E14, there you go. So, uh, yeah, worth um, worth getting yourself a set of those. So, now the flywheel off, let's have a look at the back of it. Oh, yeah, it's all in the. Uh, very very good condition i'll give it a bit of a clean up i think just get rid of some of that rust but um yeah the face is lovely it's all looking very very good so far um except i'm glad i took the engine out now because if that clutch had let go um it might have done damage to this and then you know you're, you're talking hundreds of pounds so i think it's worth doing i'm glad i took it out now that i found that the clutch is is actually knackered so let's get the signal on engine okay guys so there we go engines on the stand oil was drained and I'll leave that now overnight. I've got to be a bit careful with the dog around here. This dog here, um, when I was doing a service, it was about 2015, she drank the oil. Yes, she drank the dirty sump oil. And uh, apparently because it was um, synthetic, not mineral, it was absolutely fine. So um, she was given some medication and she had a very black oily bottom for a few days. But there we go, engine's on the stand. I've taken the filter out here. So the plastic canister on this one, taken out, but always put the plastic canister back. Even though you haven't got a filter in there, just put it back, just in case it grows. Um, you want to put it back in there so it stays the same size. It's, it's a good idea to do that. Any, any plastic parts, I always find, if you if you take them out, put them back in temporarily so they don't grow, so they don't fit again. Um, you know, plastic parts that screw in. So there we go. Um, Front crank pulley is already undone. Um, I had that out last week to have a look behind it for the uh, leak at the front. But um, I've made up a tool that goes in there to hold that. There's the tool uh, you can see there. And all that is, is just two bits of um, sort of eighth by inch and a quarter um, steel. And then draw the ends out, 10 mil holes, and then you can put six, eight or 10 mil bolts in there. And then this will just go in. You see on this front pulley here, this will just go in and lock into two of the holes like that so that's now locked in there and then you can hold it and you can use this for anything so you can use it on there if you want to you can use it for many many things it's a really handy thing to have so there you go let's look at it guys it's just a piece of strip steel and a longer piece of strip steel and then you can pivot it here and, and get any sort of pcd you want so um this was no good for pulling the um fan pulley off because it was too too long too cumbersome too long here uh, the other problem is you get of course the step because you've got the uh the different height faces obviously okay and finally just before we go i want to talk about engine stands um th this is obviously a clark engine stand i don't know if it's got the part number on it but it's, it says clark engine stand there and yeah there we go there's the part number there if you want to look it up um, it is very, very rigid and very solid. Um, you can get the ones with like a T-shaped bottom where they, you've got the main leg coming out like this and then you've got the cross across the front. That's fine. But these with the very wide carriage like this are, are really, really good for big heavy engines like these, especially V8s and stuff, because I've known them fall over. The ones that just have a single leg that come out. You can tip the engine over, especially if you start talking stuff and they will fall over, they will they will literally tip over. So um, be very, very careful about what you're buying. The, I can't remember, JGS is it? There's a company that does the, the black stuff, um, the black engine stands, and they've actually got the crossbar across the front. And they're, they're, they're great because they're really, really cheap. Um, good for the DIY guys, only going to use it once or twice. But um, this one here is a proper, proper really nice engine stand. And you can see it's, you know, the, the engine wobbles about and it keeps wobbling about, but it ain't going to fall over because it's it's wider than the engine is. It's got a good large footprint. So it's also got that drip tray in it as well, which is handy. So yeah, worth worth looking at, um, not just for your safety, but for the safety of your engine as well. And one more thing, this engine bracket on the back, it bolts to the back of the head. As I said earlier, you've got two M8 bolts there, 30 mil heads. Um, 
they're 48.5 mil apart. This is about 120, uh, 120, it's about um, 220 millimeters long. It's just a piece of one inch strip, angle strip, as you can see there. And then I've put a bolt in the end. The reason I've done that is if you, if you drill the hole there, I'll have it hanging off of there, it tries to twist it. And if you actually just put a, a hook through here, the hook will catch on the side there and it will try and bend it over. So I've put a bolt through there to allow it to kind of pivot and that removes, although it's trying to pull it over that way, it removes a twisting motion, if you know what I mean. It won't, it won't physically twist it, it will only pull it, okay? If you can imagine um, the difference in, get a round bar and pull it, or twist it. It, it. It's it's that it's that it's removing that twisting motion. So um, yeah, you don't need to buy the, the proper job. You can just use this thing. But remember to take it off before you start your engine up, because this will cause all sorts of damage to your wiring and hoses and all sorts. So, but it's easy enough to get to those two bolts at the back there once the um, once you've got these coolant pipes out of the way. Okay. So there we go, then, guys. That's it. All done. Engine's out, as you can see. And uh, I think I'm going to call it a day there for this video. So um, I'll see you back probably next week when I've done some work on uh, just giving this engine a bit of a refresh and do a bit of these uh, oil leak investigations and um, see where we go from there. Nothing's actually dripping on the floor yet, but as you can see down here, this, this area, where are we? This area here, this is uh, looking quite wet and looks like it's going to start dripping very soon. So I hate oil leaks, absolutely detest them. So um, there we go. So I'll see you all soon, guys. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.